Thank you everyone for joining today's webinar for Helix Resources Limited, ASX code HLX. Surely we'll be hearing from Managing Director Mark Rosenstrike, who will run you through a formal presentation uh, about the recent capital raising and Helix Resources being all in copper in Cobar. Um, I would remind everyone that we will be conducting a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but if you do have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll endeavour to answer as many of those as we can at the completion of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Rosenstrike, Managing Director of Helix Resources. Mike, over to you. Thank you very much, David. All in and copper and cobar, I think reflects the strategy that I brought to the company when I, enjoyed, when I joined in January of last year. The idea was to create a vehicle that was well-funded and was focused solely on its projects in the greater Cobar region and predominantly on copper. So we've been through a process of cleaning out and uh, rationalizing any other assets. So you won't see the company going off to do iron ore in the Pilbara or lithium in Argentina. We're very much focused on finding more copper in Cobar. So this map picture is really just trying to put together a snapshot of what Helix is about at the moment. And a key aspect of our investment proposition is that we have a very strategic land holding over 2000 square kilometers in the central Cobar region of New South Wales. And you can see our two land packages there on the western and eastern side, and both of them cover prodigiously mineralized structures related to the CSA copper mine, for example, and Triton's operations uh, on the eastern side there. And we've had some success on those two structures. We've had high-grade copper, in copper intercepts around our Cambaligo project. We've had some good hits on our CZ project on that Colorina trend. And all of our projects are really well located in terms of existing operations in transport infrastructure, and local townships. We're only 50 kilometers from CSA's mine or Triton or the peak here appeal deposits. We're really on the hunt for these large scale, high grade copper deposits. And we've got numerous prospects and targets emerging through which I think can uh, achieve our exploration objectives. Historically, the company has been undercapitalized and we've tended to do piecemeal type of exploration. Now we're truly well funded and we're really gonna hit all of our targets very hard. We have recently announced a placement. We have commitments for $11 million to predominantly institutional shareholders, people who are very experienced in the mining investment game and uh, they've backed us. That placement is being done at 1.2 cents. It's a large raise for a company of our size, but that's the kind of funding that we and our investors felt was meaningful to take our projects forward in a really serious fashion. We've also announced that there'll be a share place purchase plan that goes with that for $2 million and shareholders should look out. There will be some documents coming your way in the course of the next couple of weeks. And if there's any questions on any of this, then please don't hesitate to contact the company. There's a, a bit of a timetable as to when various elements of this $13 million raise are expected to complete. So a bit of a snapshot of the company as it was just before we made this announcement. Our share price was around one and a half cents and we had a market cap of 20 cents. We um, had excitement in our share price in May of last year when we announced some massive high grade copper sulfide hits. But frankly, since that time, the share price has waned. And I think partly that's due to external factors, but partly internal. We haven't managed to keep up the momentum of exploration activities and hence the flow of news and results. We think now with this extra funding and the fact that we built up our exploration team based in Orange, that we're going to be able to address that momentum aspect. You'll note here, all of the executive management team listed on the left-hand side there are new since I joined um, and Gordon Barnes, our exploration manager, joined us in May of last year and he and his team 
are all based in Orange and New South Wales. There'll be some changes to the board coming up. Tim Kennedy's uh, resigned because he's taken on a full-time position and uh, Jason McDonald is elected to retire and we are on the hunt for a new non-executive director. So this picture here really highlights the strategic nature of our land holding again in the context of what it is that our neighbours do. Glencore at the CSA mine, and this has been in the news a lot recently because it's, a, it's, it's apparently for sale, they're making 50,000 tonnes of copper in concentrates every year. And to the north of us, Triton have been throwing off about 20 to 25,000 tonnes of copper every year for the last 20 to 30 years for each of those two operations. And we have groups like Aurelia with their peak gold operations and their Hera Base Metals project, which is about to undergo a major expansion with the development of the Federation ore body. And then recently, Peel Mining have done a large capital raising as well, I think to make the transition from explorer into project developer. So it's a very exciting neighborhood to be involved in at the moment. And with our new funding position, we're determined to be players in part of that activity. So if we zoom in on our land holding itself, here you can see our Western and Eastern group tenements, which cover three key mineralized trends. The Rochford trend across here, the Colorina trend uh, up and down north and south here, south of uh, Eris's Triton operations, and in the earlier stage Mariola trend. We have the Cambelago resource located here on Rochford, and we have our CZ resource located here on Colorina. One of the points I'd like to make with this slide, and it demonstrates our commitment to this region for exploration and a change in exploration philosophy uh, since last year, and that is that aerial or, or electromagnetic surveys are a key exploration tool in this region. And up until early last year, only this area outlined in white had had EM coverage. Shortly after joining, we raised some money and within a week or two after that, we flew the rest of the uh, mineralized structures with VTEM to um, gather that regional data set. And you'll see me referring to it through the rest of the presentation. And it really demonstrates our commitment to the exploration and doing methodical, systematic, regional exploration to make sure we capture all opportunities that we can. As I said earlier, I think last year was very much about establishing a new exploration team and a new exploration strategy. And I think we've been very successful in that with high grade copper intercepts on prospects on both of those trends. And now this year is all about picking up the pace and expanding the resource base and advancing new prospects. Let me walk you through that. Let's go first to the Rochford trend on the Western side. What are we hunting for here? We're hunting for what we call Cobar style deposits. These tend to have quite small footprints and very long vertical extents. I've got an example here of CSA's copper mine. It's one of the highest grade copper mines in the world. And it's been operating now, and I think it's third phase for over 20 years. These are very rewarding discoveries if you can get onto one. I think we've got the potential, or we may be starting to unearth signs that are very similar to the style of mineralization. If we have a look at this uh, Rochford trend, we have a pipeline of opportunities here. We've got the Cambalago deposit in the central area, 1.5 million tonnes at 1.2% copper. And we've recently talked about, or made reports about the opportunity for parallel loads, very similar to what you see as, at the CSA mine, where you've got parallel loads. We've got intersected high grade copper in this area, such as 14 meters at 4.2%. And as part of that test for parallel load structures, we've also talked about visible copper sulfides being intersected at a recent drill program. And then we've got a range of earlier stage prospects up and down this Rochford trend. I think our work is starting to demonstrate real potential for this Cobar style mineralization. This is a long section through the Cambelago uh, mineral resource. This is a grade times uh, meters plot. And what you can see here is the historic resource 
outlined in this pink shell. It's about 400 metres in this direction and about 200 metres north-south. I'd like to point out that this entire Rochford area has had no work since about 2013. And it was only when we started drilling here in April of last year. And very quickly in our second drill hole, we hit 14 metres at 4.2% copper, highlighting the presence of a high grade, massive copper sulphide shoot in this area here, highlighted by these green shapes, which represent the downhole electromagnetic models. Recently, we've completed hole six, which also had a zone of, high of uh, massive copper sulphide mineralization. We've yet to get the assays from that. But it's interesting to note, we're still open at depth. And remember these cobar style ore bodies uh, tend to be most continuous in the, in the vertical direction. And the highest tenor intercepts are beneath the current resource outline. So we've got lots of work to get on with on this prospect. One of the things that everybody's reading about is the time lag in assay laboratories, and it's impacting on us as well. The positive thing about copper is that the mineralization tends to be very visual, and we're able to guide our drilling and inform the market with visual estimates of our uh, copper mineralization, as you can see by these pictures here. Chalcopyrite, one of the key copper sulfide minerals being quite yellow and having a br brassy sort of a luster. If we look now at this greater Cambelago area in plan, this here is the projection of that resource in plan view. And then we interpreted that there was an opportunity for parallel load structures occurring out here to the west, structure one and structure two. And late last year, we tested that with shallow reverse circulation drilling, and we hit copper sulfides in just about every hole, defining what we think are two parallel load structures. So that was a great result. Assays are pending, and we're hoping to get those assay results in late March. So you can see that we're starting to develop and evolve a very encouraging story for cobar style mineralization at Cambelago and potentially along that Rochford trend. Now let's just zoom out a little bit on that Rochford trend. If we look at this 20 kilometer extent, we have other prospects that we're very excited to get working on as well. So here is this greater Cambelago area. It lies within this shaded tenement, which is the joint venture that we have with Eris Resources. It's a 70-30 joint venture with Helix Holding 70 and managing. Both companies fund and both companies collaborate technically to advance the prospects. You can see just to the south of that Greater Cambelago area, we have the Caballero and then further south, the Bijou prospects. Now, what's intriguing about these is that historically, there were soil and ge geochemical soil anomalies there, and they were tested with shallow RC scout drilling. And that RC scout drilling was very successful, 33 metres at 0.2% copper or 0.7% copper. That is what scout drilling is all about. Yet, it's never been followed up. That drilling was completed in 2013. Similar story at Bijou. Geochemical anomaly in soil, scout drilling, great scout drilling results, never followed up. I think this is a bit symptomatic of this campaign or undercapitalized nature of the company in this campaign style exploration. When we did the VTEM surveys early last year, the VTEM lit up these two prospects as well, really emphasizing that these are properties that we should be ranking very highly to do further exploration work on. We have a similar situation at the north, up here, Boppy Broken Hill. Again, the VTEM is reinforcing, look at me, come and test these prospects. So we've got a lot of work to do up and down the Rochford Belt, a lot of prospects emerging and coming through, and hopefully we'll be able to advance them to resource definition style drilling. That is the massive copper sulfide intercept that we um, extracted from drill hole six. We're still waiting for the assays for that. In terms of that work that we'll now be able to accelerate by virtue of the capital raising that we've just announced, we're gonna do lots of um, drilling in terms of reverse circulation and diamond drilling to follow up some of those prospects and new prospects that we um, will generate, as well as the typical sort of surface prospecting work to firm up our targets as well as some early 
mind development, metallurgical mind study type work to not only demonstrate that we are finding more copper tons, but to also to verify that we're able to sensibly process them. Overall, our objective is to find more copper and prove up our cobar style deposit potential. So let's now move to the eastern side of the property, the Colorina trend. This is an 80 kilometer long zone, which is exactly the same stratigraphy that trends to the north into Eris's Triton operations. What we're looking for here are Triton style ore bodies. These are geologically similar, but distinct from the Cobar style deposits to the west. These tend to have ribbon-like geometry structures as shown by this long section through the Constellation deposit, which is owned by Eris. Similar for Eris's Triton ore body here, this long section. And here is an early interpretation from Helix's CZ deposits, the same ribbon-like geometry. What we have at Triton is a major copper camp, which has over 30 years of copper production. This is a planned view of our tenement position sitting just south of the Great of the Barrier Highway, just south of uh, Eris's Triton Copper Processing Plant, and right on these major regional copper trend extending from north to south, and then down here to Loxley's uh, copper projects down this way. On this trend, we have our CZ deposit, 2 million tonnes at 2% copper and a little bit of gold. And then we have numerous historical prospects, which have had some interest, have generated some results, but haven't had the follow-up. Our VTEM survey has come along. It's helped us to rank and prioritise these targets, and it's generated new discrete EM conductors in its own right. And that uh, motivated us to increase our land holding out to the eastern side here to make sure that we captured any potential targets extending over the tenement boundaries. I would point out that we also acquired recently the Homeville Laterite Nickel Cobalt Deposit. This was part of a transaction with Alpha HPA, whereby there were conflicting and overlapping royalty and joint venture rights between the two parties. And we did a transaction whereby we acquired all of the licenses there and um, removed all of those rights. And we've uh, ended up with that nickel cobalt resource. It's a bit of a side project for us, but I think there's genuine value there, which we will work quietly to extract for shareholders. So if we have a look at the plan view deposit, this is sulfide mineralization, which extends from the west and plunges down here to the east. As you can see, 14 meters at 4%, 11 at 7, 12 at 5. This is a genuine high grade copper zone, and it's about 1200 meters from left to right. We've done drilling in this area uh, halfway through in the latter part of last year, and we've had some good hits in the middle here, and we've also generated metallurgical samples. When we've tested various concepts for the resource extending down plunge, we've had some hits and misses and we're still um, reinterpreting or, or reviewing that. I guess one of the headwinds that we've had, which has impacted that momentum that I spoke about, is um, it's, it's difficult to explain, but there is 60 odd drill holes shown in yellow here, which have never been geologically logged. And it's those kind of things that do create a bit of a, uh, a headwind for our progress. But we had, some, we had a good little win here, finding a new shallow high grade Oxide copper resource, nice grades, seven meters at 2.6, seven meters at 2.8 in this over 100 meter long zone down here, which is still open to the southeast. So we would like to um, do that metallurgical test work. We'd like to develop the geological model through here because there is clearly significant copper mineralization. We just need to do the detailed geological work to understand the model here but uh, it remains a very exciting prospect for us. What I'd really like to achieve along the, along the Colorina trend is I'd like to demonstrate that some of those other prospects um, along there, such as Hermadale and Quanda and some of those VM anomalies, I'd like to demonstrate their potential to come through as emerging resources and move them through to resource definition style work so that we're starting to enable people to make direct comparisons between what's happening to the north 
around the Triton operations and that we have similar opportunities to the south on that same Colorina trend on our tenements. So the overall focus for the next 12 to 18 months is moving opportunities up that pyramid. What we're showing in this pyramid is increasing expiration success as we move um, from anomalies and targets through to prospects with say all grade intercepts up into resources and then following mine studies into potentially into reserves. And now that we have some very significant funding and support from these institutional investors, we're able to give that work a much bigger boost and achieve, I think, a lot more in a shorter time frame. Overall, what we're looking to achieve here is, say, a 200,000 tonnes contained copper that would justify a standalone operation. Potentially, any scale of resource could be commercialised given the, um, uh, the abundant processing infrastructure that occurs around us. But I think where the real fun and the real return for shareholders comes from is if we get onto one of these elephant scale deposits, such as CSA's copper mine uh, near, near Cobar. I think that's where the real um, fizz factor is in our share price. And we're always in the hunt for that as long as we are exploring and we are drilling. So we've done a lot of work. I think we've achieved a lot since last year when we've uh, implemented a new strategy. We've put a new management team in place. We focused ourselves on copper and the COBAR. And I think that has, with initial funding, has proven to be successful. We're now updating the share register. We're trying to build in stability. We've had this very significant institutional participation in the placement we've announced. And we've got this board rejuvenation happening right now. What all that enables us to do for the rest of this year is drill out resources, drill out prospects, generate lots of targets, kill a lot of them, but advance some of them. And that's what exploration is all about. And not only do we want to find the copper tons, but we also want to demonstrate that they are able to be processed sensibly and mined sensibly. So we'll do the underlying mining studies. Ultimately, we want to build up the copper resource and demonstrate a development pathway to unlock shareholder value. We want to be part of this exciting activity that's happening in the Cobar region. So just to finish off, our projects are strategically located. We have a significant land footprint. We have existing copper resources, but we're determined to build that resource inventory up. There's a lot happening in the Cobar region, both in an exploration sense and in a development sense. And then you've got these interesting commercial activities or potential sales of the CSA mine, which is underwriting value into some of these deposits. We've got a very focused and skilled exploration team. We're just recruiting two more geologists to all based in orange, right on the doorstep of our projects. And sitting in behind all of this, whilst volatile, we've got a really strong fundamental outlook for the copper price. And I think that makes a very exciting time to be an investor in Helix. Thank you, David. Thanks, Mike. A great presentation, very comprehensive and in a lot of ways answers a lot of the questions. And I would remind people if they do have a question, please submit it in writing using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. All in copper, fully funded big exploration programs across a, a large area. What, what does the drill program look like in terms of meterage, a meterage and how does that compare to previous years? We, in previous years, uh, in last year, which is probably the busiest drill year that the company's had for a very long time, I think we completed about four to 5,000 metres of drilling between reverse circulation and um, diamond drilling. We basically had an exploration team of two. What we can do now is we're planning to drill something like 20 to 30,000 metres of drilling, probably half, half diamond RC, maybe two thirds RC. And we're going to have a full time exploration team of four geologists backed up by technicians and some expert consultants. How important is it to have your technical people on the ground in orange around your project area? 
uh, I think it's critical. If, um, being based in Orange, which is blessed with many fine restaurants and wonderful vineyards in the hinterland, not on our project area, so there's no land use conflicts. It means that our team uh, goes home each night, more nights than not. They collaborate together. They get There's a real collegial collaborative atmosphere that's built up. They um, it, it just fosters this potent sort of uh, technical atmosphere where people are thinking about the projects a lot more rather than the sort of fly in, do the work, fly out, switch off, go away, or maybe go on to another job. I think it's it's really important to have locally based groups. I suppose uh, taking us inside the, the process of, of raising the capital, how you, when you walk into this process, you always have in the back of your mind probably some positive thoughts and negative thoughts. You know, what does the market think? What do the investors think? Will I raise the money? How much will I get? All of those sort of things. What did you find walking into these institutions and funds in a lot of cases for the first time? What did you find their reaction to Helix and your plans for Cobar Copper? Well, we, we work very closely with Ashanti Capital and they've been active with other clients in the area. So that was very helpful because many of their clients were already interested and aware of Cobar as an opportunity. The reason that we walked into that Ashanti area or that Ashanti opportunity and that kind of raise was because it was what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to achieve a large capital raise that removed our uncertainty in terms of where's the next lot of funding coming from. And was, look, it was always the plan to raise 2 million to develop the concepts, 5 million to prove the technical concepts, and then 10 million to kind of bring it home, if you like, through drilling out resources and completing certain studies. It didn't, it hasn't quite worked out that way because of some of those um, impacts on momentum and that that I spoke about, but ultimately that has been the plan. Now, so it's kind of the desire to raise a large chunk to be absolutely meaningful and get a clear result. And the other thing was that the institutions that we were speaking with, who were introduced to us largely by Ashanti, that's what they wanted to see as well. They didn't want us to be in and out to the market every two, three, four million dollars. They actually wanted an emphatic amount. They wanted to set themselves up and have a position in the company, and they wanted to see us then go out and do the work. And in terms of the the quantum raised and the level of support you received, were you surprised by how much support you actually have received from this this segment of the funding market? Yes, I, I was because the reality is that in some, you know, we're in a great location, there's a lot happening in the neighbourhood. And as I said, people already had an awareness. And I think Ashanti did a great job in sort of leading that. Um, but also I think there was support for the strategic nature of our tenement block. And also the fact that the company had changed its focus and had changed its strategy to be solely focused on COBRA. And I think that got respect as well. So I think there was a combination of factors that came in. When you came in, you clearly articulated and outlined a plan, as you've talked about in this presentation, around securing the, the funds, making sure there was focus, building out the technical capability, and then hitting the ground hard. You're sort of 12 months uh, or so into the plan. Did you think you would get to where you are now when you came into Helix? Um, don't take this the wrong way, but yes, it was the plan. And Look, I have to be candid and say I'm a little bit disappointed that we're not more advanced in some respects because of those headwinds that I spoke about, both external issues in terms of managing things like COVID and, um, you know, the scarcity of labour and moving people around, floods, rain, cropping cycles, but also internal things, issues that we've had to deal with internally that sort of reflect some legacy matters that we've addressed. So, look, I'm, I'm, I'm quite satisfied with where we are. I'm not satisfied with the share price but I am satisfied with where we are technically, but I'm actually, and my team, we are super excited about the opportunities ahead. So we're seeing lots of opportunities for targets that we wanna test. And now the guys know that in a disciplined way, we can methodically go around and test those targets. Does the funding and, and sort of the, the shareholder base now give you that platform to, 
to hopefully grow both the share price, but also the, the projects, like you say, in a methodical way. So not, uh, you know, a piecemeal, let's do this, raise a bit more money, do this, raise more money. You can actually open the whole, uh, the whole project portfolio up. And so let's, we can hit all these things in a, in a disciplined way, as you say, but uh, without the constraint of, of we've got to get a result today because we may not have money if we don't. Short answer is yes. I mean, one of the challenges for junior explorers, particularly when you're hunting for elephants, if you like, is there's got to be patience and persistence. And a junior company has to be prepared to take risks and fail. Exploration, as I've said many times before, is a numbers game. The more targets you test, the, the greater chance of success. But of course, that means that a lot of targets are going to fall away. And that's a risky behavior. You don't want to be telling people we tested target A, B, and C, and there's nothing there, but you know, we're going on to do DEF. If you've got the momentum and the methodology to test lots of targets with well-funded position, you can afford to take those risks. And that's how you find elephants. The challenge for junior explorers is this balance between taking appropriate risks, but making sure you can generate news flow that keeps investors engaged. Well, with this funding and the, and the programs you have planned, there's definitely going to be no shortage of news flow, which is positive for investors who, who as you say, crave that from the market. What does this funding mean in terms of um, the, the, the time scale of, of work that you can do, you know, free of the constraint of needing to raise more capital? Okay, so in terms, actually, just one other point with your previous question. I mean, to get that kind of very strong institutional support from probably half dozen to eight discrete um, entities, it does help to consolidate the register and maybe starts to change some of these range trading sort of patterns. In terms of the time frame, it's all very well having a large funded position, if you, if you, but if you haven't got the minds and bodies to go and do that work, there's, there's very little point. And we have, for the last few months, been preparing for this and we have been scaling up. So we, we have draw rigs coming, plan to come back onto our position, onto our projects in early April, and we'll build that up. And uh, I think with a larger team, it enables us to have more work paths, more workflows, if you like. And so we definitely plan to do that. When we only really had two geologists, two and a half geos, we we're always on one workflow and then we had this catch up work to do, for example, those drill holes that hadn't been logged. And that was very challenging. Now we're, we're pretty much over the hump of that. And we've got to have a team of four supported with some expert consultants as well. And we'll be able to generate maybe two, three, possibly even four discrete workflows of activity. And I think that is going to be where the success comes from, but also the news flow will get generated. There might be news one time of some hits in an advanced target, and there may be other news flow from a more regional prospect showing that a geophysical survey is starting to light up and give us encouragement in a new area. Looking forward, you, you've spent the last, um, let's call it circa 12 months, uh, delivering on a plan that when you came into Helix, uh, you identified and laid out. You've clearly got the, the next phase of the plan ready to go and now fully funded. What do you hope to achieve in the next 6, 12, 18 months? And what, what are the, what's the message to investors about what, you know, what, are the, what are the key signposts to look for over the next 6 to 12 months? Okay, look, the overall headline is that we're looking to build up the copper base which at the moment sits an attributable basis sits around 50, 55,000 tonnes of contained copper between the two resources that we have. I, I set out a target for an economic standalone deposit of around 200,000 tonnes. I'd like to think in the next 12 to 18 months that that's a target that we can hit, that gives us a lot of optionality. And with that kind of copper inventory, gives us a place in these discussions in the region in terms of development options. That's my, that's my goal, and that's what our program is set up to do. Underneath that, of course, we're always on the hunt for an elephant, and maybe we get onto the tail of one, and that changes things. Because you know, if you get onto one of these CSA scale targets, 
they are a different beast altogether, much, much greater copper endowment. But that's, I think that's my objective is to move quickly to an, to an inventory position where we can perhaps chart our own future. We have enough copper in the inventory to start thinking about our own development options or give us a very significant place in discussions on a more regional development opportunity. One thing you touched on in your presentation is that there seems to always be m a discussion when the Cobar region is brought up. There's, there's Glencore in there, as you say, with CSA. Aurelia has been, um, has been rumoured through the press. Um, and, and I don't ask you to, to sort of put an, a straight answer to it right now, but does this give the funding and who's come on board give you both a, a defensive um, opportunity so that if someone tried to, to have a go at you, you've actually got a defensive share registry to protect the business and, and protect the upside you're going to create. But the funding and the news flow also gives you the opportunity to, to, to have a look around regionally at what, what else is there. Oh, look, I, I guess perhaps a bit of all of that, but first of all, I'll just make a couple of comments to that. And one is that I'm not suggesting that we are a main player in that CSA scenario or anything of that kind. We're, we're, but we do have the strategic land position. And I think a variety of operators and emerging operators are very interested in what we're doing as an opportunity to perhaps add copper tons to their inventories. In terms of um, defensive or not, I think the, what, we, what this money allows us to do is to drive our own value up. And whatever comes out of that, in terms of offers, joint ventures, development options, they will come up. And that's how we unlock value for shareholders. So it's, it's not so strategic that we're thinking of defensively sandbagging our register, but obviously people are really, I think more, more fundamentally, people can see these guys have got a great piece of ground. It's well located in terms of these other things that I've been hearing about. Let's support them with the money to go out and build up that copper inventory and let's see what opportunities arise from that. And we, as in Helix, we have this incredible responsibility now and we have to be accountable to doing the work. I can't promise that we will find more copper tons, but we think we've got all the signs to do it. So the most fundamental thing we can do is find more copper and, and share the news, communicate effectively with the investment community so that we unlock that value. And then let's see what happens. A solid land holding, lots of targets, well-funded with a strong local exploration team who are committed to testing those targets. And, and as you say, giving it a go. Uh, a clear plan now in a well-funded position, but clearly driven to increasing shareholder value and uncovering the opportunities that the Cobar land package presents. Mike, a great presentation. Thanks for your time. Uh, look, thank you, David. Appreciate the opportunity. And thanks everybody for participating in today's webinar. A copy will be available uh, to you in the next hour or so. Uh, which we will be making available. But thanks, everybody. And if you do have any questions of the company following this presentation, please reach out to Mike directly. He's always at the end of the phone and always happy to talk to shareholders. Indeed. Indeed, I am. Thank you. Thanks.